Hello and welcome. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time. This evening, we bring you a Russian Christmas party by Leo Tolstoy. Tolstoy is considered by many as the best writer of all time. War and Peace, Anna Karenina. Well, if you've read any of these, you can understand why. His works inspired 20th century world leaders such as Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. He wrote in War and Peace. Everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. And also, there is no greatness where simplicity, goodness, and truth are absent. Our story today is not quite as lofty or philosophical as these great works, but nonetheless is rich and full in characters and story. And now, A Russian Christmas by Leo Tolstoy. Count Rostow's affairs were going from bad to worse. He was of a warm, generous nature, with unlimited faith in his servants, and hence he was blind to the mismanagement and dishonesty which had sapped his fortune. The possessor of a handsome establishment at the Russian capital Moscow, the owner of rich provincial estates, and the inheritor of a noble name and wealth, he was nevertheless on the verge of ruin. He had given up his appointment as Marchel de la Noblesse, which he had gone to his seat of Otredno to assume, because it entailed too many expenses, and yet there was no improvement in the state of his finances. Nicolas and Natasha, his son and daughter, often found their father and mother in anxious consultation, talking in low tones of the sale of their Moscow house or of their property in the neighborhood. Having thus retired into private life, the Count now gave neither fetes nor entertainments. Life at Otradno was much less gay than in past years. Still, the house and domain were as full of servants as ever, and twenty persons or more sat down to dinner daily. These were dependents, friends, and intimates, who were regarded almost as part of the family, or, at any rate, seemed unable to tear themselves away from it. Among them, a musician named Dimmler and his wife, Logel, the dancing master in his family, and old Mademoiselle Bello, former governess of Natasha, and Sonia, the Count's niece and adopted child, and now the tutor of Petya, his younger son. Besides others who found it simpler to live at the Count's expense than at their own. Thus, though there were no more festivities, life was carried on almost as expensively as of old, and neither the master nor the mistress ever imagined any change possible. Nicholas again added to the hunting establishment. There were still fifty horses in the stable, still fifteen drivers. Handsome presents were given on all birthdays and fete days, which invariably wound up as of old with a grand dinner to all the neighborhood. The Count still played whist or Boston, invariably letting his cards be seen by his friends, who were always ready to make up his table, and relieve him, without hesitation, of the few hundred roubles which constituted their principal income. The old man marched on blindfold through the tangle of his pecuniary difficulties, trying to conceal them, and only succeeded in augmenting them, having neither the courage nor the patience to untie the knots one by one. The loving heart by his side foresaw their children's ruin, but she could not accuse her husband, who was, alas, too old for amendment. She could only seek some remedy for the disaster. From her woman's point of view there was but one, Nicholas's marriage, namely, with some rich heiress. She clung desperately to this last chance of salvation, but if her son should refuse the wife she should propose to him, every hope of reinstating their fortune would vanish. The young woman she had in view was the daughter of people of the highest respectability, whom the Rostows had known from her infancy, Julie Carraguine, who by the death of her second brother had suddenly come into great wealth. The Countess herself wrote to Madame Carraguine, and asked her whether she could regard the match with favor, and received a most flattering answer. Indeed, Madame Carraguine invited Nicholas to her house at Moscow, to give her daughter an opportunity of deciding for herself. 
Nicholas had often heard his mother say, with tears in her eyes, that her dearest wish was to see him married. The fulfillment of this wish would sweeten her remaining days, she would say, adding covert hints as to a charming girl who would exactly suit him. One day she took the opportunity of speaking plainly to him of Julie's charm and merits, and urged him to spend a short time in Moscow before Christmas. Nicholas, who had no difficulty in guessing what she was aiming at, persuaded her to be explicit on the matter, and she owned frankly that her hope was to see their sinking fortunes restored by his marriage with her dear Julie. "'Then, mother, if I loved a penniless girl, you would desire me to sacrifice my feelings and my honor, to marry solely for money?' "'Nay, nay, you have misunderstood me,' she said, not knowing how to excuse her mercenary hopes. I wish only for your happiness. And then, conscious that this was not her sole aim, and that she was not perfectly honest, she burst into tears. Oh, do not cry, Mamma. You have only to say that you really and truly desire it, and you know I would give my life to see you happy, and that I would sacrifice everything, even my feelings. But this was not his mother's notion. She asked no sacrifice. She would have none. She would sooner have sacrificed herself if it had been possible. Say no more about it. You do not understand, she said, drying away her tears. How could she think of such a marriage, thought Nicholas. Does she think that because Sonia is poor I do not love her? And yet I should be a thousand times happier with her than with a doll like Julie. He stayed in the country, and his mother did not revert to the subject. Still, as she saw the growing intimacy between Nicholas and Sonia, she could not help worrying Sonia about every little thing and speaking to her with colder formality. Sometimes she reproached herself for these continual pinpricks of annoyance, and was quite vexed with the poor girl for submitting to them with such wonderful humility and sweetness, for taking every opportunity of showing her devoted gratitude and for loving Nicholas with a faithful and disinterested affection which commanded her admiration. Just about this time, a letter came from Prince André, dated from Rome, whither he had gone to pass the year of probation, demanded by his father, as a condition to giving consent to his son's marriage with the Countess Natasha. It was the fourth the prince had written since his departure. He ought long since to have been on his way home, he said, but the heat of the summer had caused the wound he had received at Austerlitz to reopen, and this compelled him to postpone his return till early in January. Natasha, though she was so much in love that her very passion for Prince André had made her daydreams happy, had hitherto been open to all the bright influences of her young life. But now, after nearly four months of parting, she fell into a state of extreme melancholy and gave way to it completely— she bewailed her hard fate. She bewailed the time that was slipping away and lost to her, while her heart ached with the dull craving to love and be loved. Nicholas, too, had spent his leave from his regiment, and the anticipation of his departure added gloom to the saddened household. Christmas came, but, excepting the pompous high mass and the other religious ceremonies, the endless string of neighbors and servants with the regular compliments of the season, and the new gowns which made their first appearance on the occasion. Nothing more than the usual happened on that day, or more extraordinary than the twenty degrees of frost, with brilliant sunshine, a still atmosphere, and at night a glorious starry sky. After dinner, on the third day of Christmas tide, when everyone had settled into his own corner once more, on we reigned supreme throughout the house. Nicholas, who had been paying a round of visits in the neighborhood, was fast asleep in the drawing room. The old count had followed his example in his own room. Sonia, seated at a table in the sitting room, was copying a drawing. The countess was playing out a patience. And Nastasia Ivanovna, the old buffoon, with his peevish face sitting in a window with two old women, did not say a word. Natasha came into the room, and after leaning over Sonia for a minute or two to examine her work, went over to her mother and stood in front of her. The countess looked up. "'Why are you wandering about like a soul in torment? What do you want?' she said. 
Want? I want him, replied Natasha shortly, and her eyes glowed. Now, here, at once! Her mother gazed at her anxiously. Don't look at me like that. You will make me cry. Sit down here. Mama, I want him. I want him. Why must I die of weariness? Her voice broke and tears started from her eyes. She hastily quitted the drawing room and went to the housekeeper's room, where an old servant was scolding one of the girls who had just come in breathless from outdoors. There is a time for all things, growled the old woman. You have had time enough for play. Oh, leave her in peace, Krondetievna, said Natasha. Run away, Mavrocha, go. Pursuing her wandering, Natasha went into the hall. An old manservant was playing cards with two of the boys. Her entrance stopped their game, and they rose. And what am I to say to these, thought she. Nikita, would you please go... What on earth can I ask for? Go and find me a chicken, and you, Mika, a handful of corn. A handful of corn, said Mika, laughing. Go, go at once, said the old man. And you, Fedder, can you give me a piece of chalk? Then she went on to the servants' hall and ordered the samovar to be got ready, though it was not yet tea time. She wanted to try her power over Foka, the old butler, the most morose and disobliging of all the servants. He could not believe his ears and asked her if she really meant it. What next will our young lady want? muttered Foka, affecting to be very cross. No one gave so many orders as Natasha. No one sent them on so many errands at once. As soon as a servant came in sight, she seemed to invent some want or message. She could not help it. It seemed as though she wanted to try her power over them, to see whether some fine day one or another would not rebel against her tyranny. But on the contrary, they always flew to obey her more readily than anyone else. And now what shall I do? Where can I go? thought she, as she slowly went along the corridor, where she presently met the buffoon. Nastasha Ivanovna, said she, if I ever have children, what will they be? You, fleas and grasshoppers, you may depend on it. Natasha went on. Good God, have mercy, have mercy, she said to herself. Wherever I go, it is always, always the same. I am so weary. What shall I do? Skipping lightly from step to step, she went to the upper story and dropped in on the Logals. Two governesses were sitting chatting with Mr. and Madam Logal. Dessert consisting of dried fruit was on the table, and they were eagerly discussing the cost of living in Moscow and Odessa. Natasha took a seat for a moment, listened with pensive attention, and then jumped up again. The Isle of Madagascar, she murmured. Madagascar. And she separated the syllables. Then she left the room without answering Madame Shosh, who was utterly mystified by her strange exclamation. She next met Petya and a companion, both very full of some fireworks which were to be let off that evening. Petya, she exclaimed, carry me down the stairs. And she sprang upon his back, throwing her arms round his neck, and laughing and galloping. They thus scrambled along to the head of the stairs. Thank you, that will do. Madagascar, she repeated, and jumping down, she ran down the flight. After thus inspecting her dominions, testing her power, and convincing herself that her subjects were docile, and that there was no novelty to be got out of them, Natasha settled herself in the darkest corner of the music room with her guitar, striking the bass strings, and trying to make an accompaniment to an air from an opera that she and Prince Andre had once heard together at St. Petersburg. The uncertain chords which her unpractised fingers sketched out would have struck the least experienced ear as wanting in harmony and musical accuracy, while to her excited imagination they brought a whole train of memories. Leaning against the wall and half hidden by a cabinet, with her eyes fixed on a thread of light that came under the door from the rooms beyond, she listened in ecstasy and dreamed of the past. Sonya crossed the room with a glass in her hand. Natasha glanced round at her and again fixed her eyes on the streak of light. 
She had the strange feeling of having once before gone through the same experience, sat in the same place, surrounded by the same details, and watching Sonia pass carrying a tumbler. Yes, it was exactly the same, she thought. Sonia, what is this tune? she said, playing a few notes. What are you there? said Sonia, startled. I don't know, she said, coming closer to listen. Unless it is from La Tempite, but she spoke doubtfully. It was exactly so, thought Natasha. She started as she came forward, smiling so gently, and I then thought, as I think now, that there is something in her which is quite lacking in me. No, she said aloud, you are quite out. It is the chorus from the Porte d'O. Listen! And she hummed the air. Where are you going? For some fresh water for my drawing. You are always busy, and I never. Where is Nicholas? Asleep, I think. Go and wake him, Sonia. Tell him to come and sing. Sonia went, and Natasha relapsed into dreaming and wondering how it all happened. Not being able to solve the puzzle, she drifted into reminiscence once more. She could see him, him, and feel his impassioned eyes fixed on her face. Oh, make haste back. I am so afraid he will not come yet. Besides, it is all very well, but I am growing old. I shall be quite different from what I am now. Who knows? Perhaps he will come today. Perhaps he is here already, here in the drawing room. Perhaps he came yesterday and I have forgotten. She rose, laid down the guitar, and went into the next room. All the household party were seated round the tea table, the professors, the governesses, the guests, the servants were waiting on one and another. But there was no Prince André. "'Ah, here she is,' said her father. "'Come and sit down here.' But Natasha stopped by her mother without heeding his bidding. "'Oh, Mamma, bring him to me. Bring him to me soon, very soon,' she murmured, swallowing down a sob. Then she sat down and listened to the others. Good God, always the same people, always the same thing. Papa holds his cup as he always does and blows his tea to cool it as he did yesterday and as he will tomorrow. She felt a sort of dull rebellion against them all. She hated them for always being the same. After tea, Sonia, Natasha, and Nicholas huddled together in their favorite snug corner of the drawing room. That was where they talked freely to each other. Do you ever feel, Natasha asked her brother, as if there was nothing left to look forward to, as if you had all your share of happiness and were not so much weary as utterly dull? Of course I have. Very often I have seen my friends and fellow officers in the highest spirits and been just as jolly myself, and suddenly have been struck so dull and dismal, have so hated life, that I have wondered whether we were not all to die at once. I remember one day, for instance, when I was with my regiment. The band was playing, and I had such a fit of melancholy that I never even thought of going to the promenade. Well, how well I understand that. I recollect once, Natasha went on, once when I was a little girl. I was punished for having eaten some plums, I think. I had not done it, and you were all dancing, and I was left alone in the schoolroom. How I cried, cried because I was so sorry for myself, and so vexed with you all for making me so unhappy. I remember, and I went to comfort you and did not know how. We were funny children then. I had a toy with bells that jingled, and I made you a present of it. Do you remember, said Natasha, long before that, when we were no bigger than my hand, my uncle called us into his room where it was quite dark, and suddenly we saw... A negro, interrupted Nicholas, smiling at her recollection. To be sure, I can see him now, and to this day I wonder whether it was a dream or reality, or mere fancy invented afterwards. He had white teeth and stared at us with black eyes. Do you remember him, Sonia? Yes, yes, but very dimly. But Papa and Mamma have always declared that no Negro ever came to the house. And the eggs. Do you remember the eggs we used to roll up at Easter? And one day how two little greeting old women came up through the floor and began to spin around the table. 
Of course! And how Papa used to put on his fur coat and fire off his gun from the balcony. And don't you remember? And so they went on, recalling, one after the other, not the bitter memories of old age, but the bright pictures of early childhood, which float and fade on a distant horizon of poetic vagueness, midway between reality and dreams. Sonia remembered being frightened once at the sight of Nicholas in his braided jacket, and her nurse promising her that she should some day have a frock trimmed from top to bottom. "'And they told me you had been found in the garden under a cabbage,' said Natasha. "'I dared not say it was not true, but it puzzled me tremendously.' A door opened, and a woman put in her head, exclaiming, "'Mademoiselle, mademoiselle, they have fetched the chicken!' "'I do not want it now. Send it away again, Polya,' said Natasha. Dimmler, who had meanwhile come into the room, went up to the harp, which stood in a corner, and in taking off the cover made the strings ring discordantly. "'Edward Karlovich, play my favorite nocturne, Fields,' cried the countess from the adjoining room. Dimmler struck a chord. "'How quiet you young people are,' he said, addressing them. "'Yes, we are studying philosophy,' said Natasha. And they went on talking of their dreams." Dimmler had no sooner begun his nocturne than Natasha, crossing the room on tiptoe, seized the wax light that was burning on the table and carried it into the next room. Then she stole back to her seat. It was now quite dark in the large room, especially in their corner, but the silvery moonbeams came in at the wide windows and lay in broad sheets on the floor. "'Do you know?' whispered Natasha, while Dimmler, after playing the nocturne, let his fingers wander over the strings, uncertain what to play next. When I go on remembering one thing beyond another, I go back so far, so far, that at last I remember things that happened before I was born, and that is metem of psychosis, interrupted Sonia, with the remembrance of her early lessons. The Egyptians believed that our souls had once inhabited the bodies of animals and would return to animals again after our death. I do not believe that, said Natasha, still in a low voice, though the music had ceased. But I am quite sure that we were angels once, somewhere there or beyond, or perhaps even here, and that is the reason we remember a previous existence. May I join the party? asked Dimmler, coming towards them. If we were once angels, how is it that we have fallen lower? Lower? Who says that it's lower? Who knows what I was? Natasha retorted with full conviction. Since the soul is immortal, and I am to live forever in the future, I must have existed in the past. So I have eternity behind me, too. Yes, but it's very difficult to conceive of that eternity, said Dimmler, whose ironic smile had died away. Why? asked Natasha. After today comes tomorrow, and then the day after, and so on forever. Yesterday has been, tomorrow will be. Natasha, now it is your turn. Sing me something, said her mother. What are you doing in that corner like a party of conspirators? I am not at all in the humor, Mamma," said she. Nevertheless, she rose. Nicholas sat down to the piano, and standing as usual in the middle of the room, where the voice sounded best, she sang her mother's favorite ballad. Though she had said she was not in the humor, it was long since Natasha had sung so well as she did that evening, and long before she sang so well again. Her father, who was talking over business with Matinka in his room, hurriedly gave him some final instructions as soon as he heard the first note, as a schoolboy clambers through his tasks to get to his play. But as the steward did not go, he sat in silence, listening, while Matenka, too, standing in his presence, listened with evident satisfaction. Nicholas did not take his eyes off his sister's face, and only breathed when she took a breath. Sonia was under the spell of that exquisite voice, and thinking of the gulf of difference that lay between her and her friend, full conscious that she could never exercise such fascination. The old countess had paused in her patience. A sad, fond smile played on her lips. Her eyes were full of tears, and she shook her head, remembering her own youth, looking forward to her daughter's future, and reflecting on her strange prospects of marriage. Dimmler, sitting by her side, listened with rapture, 
his eyes half closed. She really has a marvelous gift, he exclaimed. She has nothing to learn. Such power, such sweetness, such roundness. And how much I fear for her happiness, replied the countess, who in her mother's heart could feel the flame that must some day be fatal to her child's peace. Natasha was still singing when Petya dashed noisily into the room to announce in triumphant tones that a party of mummers had arrived. Idiot! exclaimed Natasha, stopping short, and dropping into a chair, she began to sob so violently that it was some time before she could recover herself. It is nothing, Mamma, really nothing at all, she declared, trying to smile. Only Petya frightened me, nothing more, and her tears flowed afresh. All the servants had dressed up, some as bears, Turks, tavern keepers, or fine ladies, others as mongrel monsters. Bringing with them the chill of the night outside, they did not at first venture any farther than the hall. By degrees, however, they took courage. Pushing each other forward for self-protection, they all soon came into the music room. Once there, their shyness thawed. They became expansively merry, and singing, dancing, and sporting were soon the order of the day. The countess, after looking at them and identifying them all, went back into the sitting room, leaving her husband, whose jovial face encouraged them to enjoy themselves. The young people had all vanished, but half an hour later, an old marquis with patches appeared on the scene, none other than Nicholas, Petya as a Turk, a clown, Dimmler, a hussar, Natasha, and a Circassian, Sonia. Both the girls had blackened their eyebrows and given themselves moustaches with burnt cork. After being received with well-feigned surprise, and recognized more or less quickly, the children, who were very proud of their costumes, unanimously declared that they must go and display them elsewhere. Nicholas, who was dying to take them all for a long drive on Troika, proposed that, as the roads were in splendid order, they should go, a party of ten, to the little uncles, a team of three horses harnessed abreast. "'You will disturb the old man, and that will be all,' said the countess. "'Why, he has not even room for you all to get into the house. "'If you must go out, you had better go to the Bellicos.' "'Madame Mellico was a widow living in the neighborhood. "'Her house, full of children of all ages, "'with tutors and governesses, "'was distant only four versts from Otradno. "'A capital idea, my dear,' cried the Count, enchanted. "'I will dress up in costume and go, too. "'I will wake them up, I warrant you.' "'But this did not at all meet his wife's views.' perfect madness. For him to go out with his gouty feet in such cold weather was sheer folly. The Count gave way, and Madame Schoss volunteered to chaperone the girls. Sonia's was by far the most successful disguise. Her fierce eyebrows and moustache were wonderfully becoming. Her pretty features gained expression, and she wore the dress of a man with unexpected swagger and smartness. Something in her innermost soul told her that this evening would seal her fate. In a few minutes, four sleighs with three horses abreast to each, their harness jingling with bells, drew up in a line before the steps, the runners creaking and crunching over the snow. Natasha was the foremost, and the first to tune her spirits to the pitch of this carnival freak. This mirth, in fact, proved highly infectious, and reached its height of tumult and excitement when the party went down the steps and packed themselves into the sleighs, laughing and shouting to each other at the top of their voices. Two of the sleighs were drawn by light cart horses. To the third, the Count's carriage horses were harnessed, and one of these was reputed a famous trotter from Orlo's stable. The fourth sleigh, with its rough-coated black shaft horse, was Nicholas's private property, in his marquee costume, over which he had thrown his hussar's cloak, fastened with a bell around the waist, he stood gathering up the reins. The moon was shining brightly, reflecting in the plating of the harness and in the horse's anxious eyes as they turned their heads in uneasy amazement at the noisy group that clustered under the dark porch. Natasha, Sonia, and Madame Schoss, with two women servants, got into Nicholas's sleigh. Dimmler and his wife, with Petya, into the counts, the rest of the mummers packed into the other sleighs. "'Lead the way, Zakhar!' cried Nicholas to his father's coachman, 
Promising himself the pleasure of outstripping him presently, the Count's sleigh swayed and strained. The runners, which the frost had already glued to the ground, creaked. The bells rang out, the horses closed up for a pole, and off they went over the glittering hard snow, flinging it up, right and left like spray of powdered sugar. Nicholas started next, and the others followed along the narrow way, with no less jingling and creaking. While they drove under the wall of the park, the shadows of the tall, skeleton trees lay on the road, checkering the broad moonlight. But as soon as they had left it behind them, the wide and spotless plain spread out on all sides, its whiteness broken by myriads of flashing sparks and spangles of reflected light. Suddenly, a rut caused the foremost lead to jolt violently, and then the others in succession. They fell away a little, their intrusive clatter breaking the supreme, solemn silence of the night. "'A hare's tracks!' exclaimed Natasha, and her voice pierced the frozen air like an arrow. "'How light it is, Nicholas!' said Sonia. Nicholas turned round to look at the pretty face with its black moustache, under the sable hood, looking at once so far away and so close in the moonshine. "'It is not Sonia at all,' he said, smiling. "'Why, what is the matter?' "'Nothing,' said he, returning to his former position." When they got out on the high road, beaten and plowed by horses' hoofs and polished with the tracks of sleighs, his steeds began to pull and go at a great pace. The near horse, turning his head away, was galloping rather wildly, while the horse in the shaft pricked his ears, and still seemed to doubt whether the moment for a dash had come. Zakhar's sleigh, lost in the distance, was no more than a black spot on the white snow, and as he drew farther away, the ringing of the bells was fainter and fainter. Only the shouts and songs of the maskers rang through the calm, clear night. "'Oh, you go, my beauties!' cried Nicholas, shaking the reins and raising his whip. The sleigh seemed to leap forward, but the sharp air that cut their faces and the flying pace of the two outer horses alone gave them any idea of the speed they were making. Nicholas glanced back at the other two drivers. They were shouting and urging their shaft horses with cries and cracking of whips so as not to be quite left behind. Nicholas's middle horse, swinging steadily along under the shaft bow, kept his regular pace, quite ready to go twice as fast the moment he should be called upon. They soon overtook the first troika, and after going down a slope they came upon a wide crossroad running by the side of a meadow. "'Where are we, I wonder?' thought Nicholas. "'This must be the field and slope by the river. No, I don't know where we are. This is all new and unfamiliar to me.' God knows where we are, but no matter. And smacking his whip with a will, he went straight ahead. Zakhar held in his breast for an instant and turned his face, all fringed with frost, to look at Nicholas, who came flying onward. Steady there, sir, cried the coachman, and leaning forward with a click of his tongue, he urged his horses in their turn to their utmost speed. For a few minutes the sleighs ran equal, but before long, in spite of all Zakhar could do, Nicholas gained on him and at last flew past him like a lightning flash. A cloud of fine snow, kicked up by the horses, came showering down on the rival sleigh. The women squeaked, and the two teams had a struggle for the precedence, their shadows crossing and mingling on the snow. Then Nicholas, moderating his speed, looked about him. Before, behind, and on each side of him stretched the fairy scene, a plain strewn with stars and flooded with light. "'To the left,' Zakhar said. "'Why to the left?' thought he. "'We were going to the Melicos, but we are going where fate directs, or as heaven may guide us. It is all very strange and most delightful, is it not?' he said, turning to the others. "'Oh, look at his eyelashes and beard! They are quite white!' exclaimed one of the sweet young men with penciled mustache and arched eyebrows. "'That, I believe, is Natasha,' said Nicholas. "'And that little Circassian, who is he? I do not know him, but I like his looks uncommonly. Are you frozen?' Their answer was a shout of laughter. Dimmler was talking himself hoarse, and he must be saying very funny things, for the party in his sleigh were in fits of laughing.' 
Better and better, said Nicholas to himself. Now we are all in an enchanted forest. The black shadows lie across a flooring of diamonds and mix with the sparkling gems. That might be a fairy palace out there, built of large blocks of marble and jeweled tiles. Did I not hear the howl of wild beasts in the distance? Supposing it were only Melikovka that I am coming to after all, on my word, it would be no less miraculous to have reached port after steering so completely random. It was, in fact, Melikovka, for he could see the house servants coming out on the balcony with lights, and then down to meet them, only too glad of this unexpected diversion. "'Who is there?' a voice within asked. "'The mummers from Count Rostow's. They are his teams,' replied the servants. Pelagouia Danilovna Melako, a stout and commanding personality in spectacles and a flowing dressing gown, was sitting in her drawing room surrounded by her children, whom she was doing her best to amuse by modeling heads in wax and tracing the shadows they cast on the wall, when steps and voices were heard in the anteroom. Hussars, witches, clowns, and bears were rubbing their faces, which were scorched by the cold and covered with rime, or shaking the snow off their clothes. As soon as they cast off their furs, they rushed into the large drawing room, which was hastily lighted up. Dimmler, the clown, and Nicholas, the marquis, performed a dance, while the others stood close along the wall, the children shouting and jumping about with glee. "'It is impossible to know who is who. "'Can that really be Natasha? "'Look at her. "'Does she not remind you of someone? "'Edward, before Karlovich, "'how fine you are, "'and how beautifully you dance. "'Oh, and that splendid Circassian. "'Why, it is Sonia. "'What a kind and delightful surprise. "'We were so desperately dull. <laughs> "'What a beautiful hussar! "'A real hussar, or a real monkey of a boy? "'Which is he, I wonder? "'I cannot look at you without laughing!' "'They all shouted and laughed and talked at once "'at the top of their voices. "'Natasha, to whom the Melicos were devoted, "'soon vanished with them into their own room, "'where corks and various articles of men's clothing "'were brought to them, "'and clutched by bare arms through a half-open door.' Ten minutes later, all the young people of the house rejoined the company, equally unrecognizable. Pelagia Danilovna, going and coming among them all, with her spectacles on her nose and a quiet smile, had seats arranged and a supper laid out for the visitors, masters and servants alike. She looked straight in the face of each in turn, recognizing no one of the motley crew, neither the Rostos, nor Dimmler, nor, nor even her own children, nor any of the clothes they figured in. "'That one? Who is she?' she asked the governess, stopping at Kazan Tartar, who was in fact her own daughter. "'One of the Rostos, is it not? And you, gallant hussar, what regiment do you belong to?' she went on, addressing Natasha. "'Give some pastela to this Turkish lady,' she cried to the butler. "'It is not forbidden in her religion, I believe.' At the sight of some of the reckless dancing which the mummers performed under the shelter of their disguise, Palaguia Danilovna could not help hiding her face in her handkerchief, while her huge person shook with uncontrollable laughter. The laugh of a kindly matron, frankly jovial and gay. When they had danced all the national dances, ending with the Haravodi, she placed everyone, both masters and servants, in a large circle, holding a cord with a ring and a rouble. And for a while they played games. An hour after, when the finery was the worse for wear, and heat and laughter had removed much of the charcoal, Palaguia Denilovna could recognize them, compliment the girls on the success of their disguise, and thank the whole party for the amusement they had given her. Supper was served for the company in the drawing-room and for the servants in the large dining-room. "'You should try your fortune in the bathroom over there. That is enough to frighten you,' said an old maid who lived with the Malikos. "'Why?' said the eldest girl. "'Oh, you would never dare to do it. You must be very brave.' "'Well, I will go,' said Sonia. "'Tell us what happened to the young girl, you know,' said the youngest Malico. Once, a young girl went to the bath, taking with her a cock and two plates with knives and forks, which is what you must do. And she waited. 
Suddenly she heard horses' bells. Someone was coming. He stopped, came upstairs, and she saw an officer walk into the room, a real live officer, at least so he seemed, who sat down opposite her where the second cover was laid. Oh, how horrible, exclaimed Natasha, wide-eyed. And he spoke to her, really spoke? Yes, just as if he had really been a man. He begged and prayed her to listen to him, and all she had to do was to refuse him and hold out till the cock crowed. But she was much too frightened. She covered her face with her hands, and he clasped her in his arms. Luckily, some girls who were on the watch rushed in when she screamed. Why do you terrify them with such nonsense? said Palaguia Danilovna. "'But, Mamma, you know you wanted to try your fortune, too.' "'And if you try your fortune in a barn, what do you do?' asked Sonia. "'Well, this is quite simple. "'You must go to the barn now, for instance, and listen. "'If you hear thrashing, it is for ill luck. "'If you hear grain dropping, that is good.' "'Tell us, Mother, what happened to you in the barn?' "'It was so long ago,' said the mother with a smile, "'that I have quite forgotten.' "'Besides, not one of you is brave enough to try it.' "'Yes, I will go,' said Sonia. "'Let me go. Oh, "'By all means, if you are not afraid.' "'May I, Madame Chasse?' said Sonia to the governess. "'Now, whether playing games or sitting quietly and chatting, "'Nicholas had not left Sonia's side the whole evening. "'He felt as if he had seen her for the first time "'and only just now appreciated all her merits.' Bright, bewitchingly pretty in her quaint costume, and excited as she very rarely was, she had completely fascinated him. What a simpleton I must have been, thought he, responding in thought to those sparkling eyes and that triumphant smile, which had revealed to him a little dimple at the tip of her mustache that he must had never observed before. I am afraid of nothing, she declared. She rose, asked her way precisely to the barn, and every detail as to what she was to expect, waiting there in total silence. Then she threw a fur cloak over her shoulders, glanced at Nicholas, and went on. She went along the corridor and down the back stairs, while Nicholas, saying that the heat of the room is too much for him, slipped out by the front entrance. It was as cold as ever, and the moon seemed to be shining even more brightly than before. The snow at her feet was strewn with stars, while their sisters overhead twinkled in the deep gloom of the sky, and she soon looked away from them, back to the glimmering earth in its radiant mantle of ermine. Nicholas hurried across the hall, turned the corner of the house, and went past the side door where Sonia was to come out. Halfway to the barn, stacks of wood in the full moonlight threw their shadows on the path, and beyond an alley of lime trees traced a tangled pattern on the snow with the fine crossed lines of their leafless twigs. The beams of the house and its snow-laden roof looked as if they had been hewn out of a block of opal, with iridescent lights where the facets caught the silvery moonlight. Suddenly a bough fell crashing off a tree in the garden, then all was still again. Sonia's heart beat high with gladness, as if she were drinking in not common air, but some life-giving elixir of eternal youth and joy. "'Straight on, if you please, miss, and on no account look behind you.' "'I am not afraid,' said Sonia, her little shoes tapping the stone steps and then crunching the carpet of snow as she ran to meet Nicholas, who was within a couple yards of her, and yet not the Nicholas of everyday life. What had transfigured him so completely?' Was it his woman's costume with frizzed-out hair, or was it that radiant smile which he so rarely wore, and which at this moment illuminated his face? But Sonia is quite unlike herself, and yet she is herself, thought Nicholas on his side, looking down at the sweet little face in the moonlight. He slipped his arms under the fur cloak that wrapped her, and drew her to him, and he kissed her lips, which still tasted of the burned cork that had blackened her moustache. Nicholas, Sonia, they whispered, and Sonia put her little hands around his face. Then, hand in hand, they ran to the barn and back, and each went in by the different doors they had come out of. 
Natasha, who had noted everything, managed so that she, Madame Schoss, and Dimmler should return in one sleigh, while the maids met with Nicholas and Sonia in another. Nicholas was in no hurry to get home. He could not help looking at Sonia and trying to find, under her disguise, the true Sonia, his Sonia, from whom nothing could ever part him. The magical effects of moonlight, the remembrance of that kiss on her sweet lips, the dizzy flight of the snow-clad ground under the horse's hoofs, the black sky studded with diamonds that bent over their heads, the icy air that seemed to give vigor to his lungs. All was enough to make him fancy that they were transported to a land of magic. Sonia, are you not cold? No. And you? Nicholas pulled up, and giving the reins to a man to drive, he ran back to the sleigh in which Natasha was sitting. Listen, he said, in a whisper and in French. I have made up my mind to tell Sonia. And have you spoken to her? exclaimed Natasha, radiant with joy. Oh, Natasha, how queer that moustache makes you look. Are you glad? Glad? I am delighted. I did not say anything, you know, but I have been so vexed with you. She is a jewel, a heart of gold. I... I am often naughty, and I have no right to have all the happiness to myself now. Go, go back to her. No, wait a minute. Mercy, how funny you look, he repeated, examining her closely and discovering her face too, an unwanted tenderness and emotion that struck him deeply. Natasha, is there not some magic at the bottom of it all, eh? You have acted very wisely. Go! If I have ever seen Natasha look as she does at this moment, I should have asked her advice and have obeyed her, whatever she had bid me to do, and all would have gone well. So are you glad, he said aloud, I have done right? Yes, yes, of course you have. I was quite angry with Mamma the other day about you too. Mamma would have it that Sonia was running after you. I will not allow anyone to say, no, nor even think, any evil of her, for she is sweetness and truth itself. So much the better. Nicholas jumped down and in a few long strides overtook his own sleigh, where the little Circassian received him with a smile from under the fur hood. And the Circassian was Sonia, and Sonia beyond a doubt would be his beloved little wife. When they got home, the two girls went into the countess's room and gave her an account of their expedition. Then they went to bed, Without stopping to wipe off their moustaches, they stood chattering as they undressed. They had so much to say of their happiness, their future prospects, the friendship between their husbands. But, oh, when will it all be? I am so afraid it will never come to pass, said Natasha, as she went toward a table on which two looking-glasses stood. Sit down, said Sasha, and look at the glass. Perhaps you will see something about it. Natasha lighted two pairs of candles and seated herself. I certainly see a pair of mustaches, she said laughing. You should not laugh, said the maid gravely. Natasha settled herself to gaze without blinking into the mirror. She put on a solemn face and sat in silence for some time, wondering what she should see. Would a coffin rise before her? Or would Prince Andre presently stand, revealed against the confused background in the shiny glass? Her eyes were weary and could hardly distinguish even the flickering light of the candles. But with the best will in the world, she could see nothing, not a spot to suggest the image either of a coffin or of a human form. She rose. Why do other people see things and I never see anything at all? Take my place, Sonia. You must look for yourself and for me too. I am so frightened. If I could but know... Sonia sat down and fixed her eyes on the mirror. Sophia Alexandrovna will sure to be something, whispered the maid. But you are always laughing at such things. Sonia heard the remark in Natasha's whispered reply. Yes, she is sure to see something. She did last year. Three minutes they waited in total silence. She is sure to see something, Natasha repeated, trembling. Sonia started back, covered her face with one hand, and cried out, Natasha! You saw something! What did you see? And Natasha rushed forward to hold up the glass. 
But Sonia had seen nothing. Her eyes were getting dim, and she was on the point of giving it up when Natasha's exclamation had stopped her. She did not want to disappoint them, but there was nothing so tiring as sitting motionless, and she did not know why she had called out and hidden her face. "'Did you not see him?' asked Natasha. "'Yes. Stop a minute. I saw him.' said Sonia, not quite sure whether him was to mean Nicholas or Prince Andre. Why not make them believe that I saw something, she thought. A great many people have done so before, and no one can prove the contrary. Yes, I saw him, she repeated. How? Standing up or lying down? I saw him. At first there was nothing. Then suddenly I saw him lying down. Andre, lying down? Then he is ill. And Natasha gazed horror stricken at her companion. Not at all. He seemed quite cheerful, on the contrary, said she, beginning to believe in her own inventions. And then? Sonia, what then? Then I saw only confusion. Red and blue. And when will he come back, Sonia? When shall I see him again? Oh, God, I am afraid for him, afraid of everything. And, without listening to Sonia's attempt at comfort, Natasha slipped into bed, and long after the lights were out, she lay motionless but awake, her eyes fixed on the moonshine that came dimly through the frost-embroidered snow. And that's our story for this evening. I hope you enjoyed A Russian Christmas Party by Leo Tolstoy. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time.